Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Mr. Jeffrey Moore. Uh, Jeffrey Moore has a sterling reputation here in Silicon Valley. He's been an advisor uh, to all kinds of CEOs and companies here. Uh, he wrote a book a few years ago uh, <laughs> called Crossing the Chasm. And for those of you who've gone to uh, business school, I'm sure you probably had it as one of your required readings of uh, most of the business schools in the country. Uh, but he's also written a couple of other books since then. Okay, all right, uh-oh. He's, he's bringing out his glasses now. Okay. All right. So after Crossing the Chasm, we have Inside the Tornado. We have Dealing with Darwin. We have Living on the Fault Line. These have got to be the greatest books about management. <laughs> the titles alone, I'm sure, have drawn many people to uh, read these books. But uh, they all have been read by many, many people in the industry, uh, especially folks who are keen to take their small, innovative ideas, their new companies, and make them grow. Crossing the chasm, getting from this stage to where I know we all want to be. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey and let him. Uh, well, th on. thank you, Kevin, thank very you. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so great. So as, as Kevin says, I, I'm from Silicon Valley. Aquaculture is a whole new world to me. It didn't occur to me that you'd have an aquaculture uh, event on top of a mountain as far from the fish as you could get. <laughs> But then I learned that Kevin is a university professor in Arizona, obviously a very closely, uh, close to, to the source of water. <laughs> so obviously there's something going on. Look, he, one of the things I, in talking with you, I talked with several of you tonight that I, I'm very honored by and, re, and have a lot of respect for, is you know, Silicon Valley is very good at doing innovation. And actually it's got a very strong uh, tendency to philanthropy, but they're not connected. They're, they're very dissociated. So people make their money over here and they give their money away over here. What is interesting about the community here today, you are an integrated community of innovation and philanthropy. You are doing good and doing well together. It's, it, it's inspiring. It's something that Silicon Valley needs to learn from you. What I'm going to try to do tonight is to pass a couple of lessons the other direction. And it has to do with what have we learned about managing breakthrough innovation at Silicon Valley that might be helpful to, your, to, to you, as you as you take your new technologies to, to, to market. So basically, this is based on two books. Uh, the first book is called Crossing the Chasm. That was from the point of view of the startup. So how many people here are either in a startup or would like to start a startup? OK, this is your book, OK? That's the book for you, OK? This is the book for a large company that realizes if it doesn't embrace the next technology, it's going gonna, it's gonna to miss the next wave. How many people here are from a large company? If you're from a large company, this is your book, OK? <laughs> so I'm going to do, a, do a part one on, the, on crossing the chasm and part two on zone to win. But they're both about the same journey, the same journey of going from a, an idea that could possibly work to something that happens at scale. And that, that, that's the journey that we all have in common. So the challenge for the startup, one is to make a product that actually works. I mean, that's not easy. And a bunch of, a bunch of startups don't even get that far. But, you, but you, you, you gave it a try. And then if you can make it work, it's getting adoption from the mainstream customers, getting, getting them to go all, go all the way to success. So, what you find out about this journey is it's too early to have data. There's no data in this journey because it, you're inventing it as you go along. So there are some frameworks that help you anticipate the challenges you're going to have. That's what I want to share with you now. These, these frameworks say, having watched hundreds of companies go through this journey, there are some patterns that you can leverage as you make your decisions. And they're very helpful. So that's what I want to share with you. And the number one pattern is something called the technology adoption life cycle. And this model says that when you introduce a disruptive innovation, something that's going to change the way the economy of that sector works, into any community, the community will self-segregate into five different responses. And each response is very different from the others. We have the, 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 the bell curve says way at the left are the people that adopt first. 
So it's the technology adoption enthusiasts first, then the visionaries, then the pragmatists, then the conservatives, and finally the skeptics. And each one of these communities has its own point of view. And it, as you're going through this life cycle, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to change your strategy and your whole approach as you move through the life cycle. And that's what this framework is designed to do. So I'm going to give you a profile of these five folks, and then I'll show you how it plays out. So the first one, I don't know, for those of you uh, from America, this is Sheldon from, from Big Bang Theory. He, he, he's, he's a technology enthusiast. Technology enthusiasts want to know how it works. So if you're doing something amazing with, with, with shrimp or you're trying to solve the lice problem with salmon or whatever it is you're trying to do, they want to know how. What chemical? What, what's the biochemical reaction? What's going on there? They want to talk to your engineers. They don't want to talk to the marketing people. They don't want to talk to the salespeople. Those are very nice people. They're just not very smart. You know, <laughs> they, I want to talk to the smart people, right? I will help you in any way I can. They're, they're, they, they will volunteer their time to help you because they're fascinated by what you're doing. They want to be a part of technology forums like this one. They don't have any money. <laughs> so that's bad, uh, but, they, but, but the truth is they, the rest of the group, these other four groups, they listen to this group and if this group says, no, you know what, this is false, this is not true, then nobody else will listen. Carl and I were talking about cold fusion. There was a time when Sheldon said there's no such thing as cold fusion. Okay, there's no such thing as cold fusion. Carl now tells me, hey, guess what? Yeah, not so fast. Okay, then Sheldon says, that, hey, there is something called cold fusion. Okay, now I'd like to hear about it. But you have to, you have to help that person help you educate your, your audience or you can't go further. But the next group, the visionary, and of course this is Steve Jobs, the visionary has a, is, the person who, is a person who says, and they're a customer now, they're, 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 not, they're not in your company, they're a customer, who says, oh, excuse me, who, oh, back, sorry, I wanna go, want go back, sorry, back, 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 thanks. Um, they're a customer who says, look, I think there's a chance to change the world here, and I wanna change the world. So I want to go now, and I want to go early, and I know it's early, so I need, your, I need the very best talent in the world, not only from your company, from my company, and any other company I can find. And then, if you think about how he did the iPod or the iPad or, or any of that, the iPhone, that's what he did. Early access to technology, custom integration, I want to influence the roadmap. These are computer ideas, so I'm not sure how well they're going to map exactly to your, to your world. But I need to make a, I want your company to make a complete commitment and I have money and I will spend whatever it takes because I want to make this thing happen. That, that, that's what I want to do. Very, very exciting. And these are, these are your first customers to kind of put the idea on the map. There aren't very many of them, okay? So you can't build a business around these customers, but they're the first ones to, to show the way. Where you can build a business is around this group we call the pragmatists. Now the pragmatists, are, are, are people who say, I'm going to do this when I see other people doing it. So their first question is, do I, are you doing it yet? No, 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 no. Okay, me neither. Good. Okay. <laughs> and then some later date, they go, you are, you are, you are, you are. Oh my God, me too. Okay. <laughs> so if you've ever been to a junior high dance, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not going out there. I'm not, oh, 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 oh. is it time yet? Is it, oh, okay. Now I go. Okay, so you, the, the problem with technology adoption is how do you get people to be first when none of them want to be first? And so what I've done is I've taken a circle and I've put it around this, this uh, what is, let's see if I see this circle that's going to come up and circle just one pragmatist. This, is a, this woman is what we call a pragmatist in pain. Her problem, she has a problem that she can't solve with conventional technology. So she doesn't want to adopt disruptive technology, but she's getting to the point where she says, I don't think I have a, a reasonable choice if I don't. And so what they say, she says is, and her, her, her team will say to you, if you can come in and understand my problem, that means domain expertise in my industry, not your industry, my industry. If you can give me solution consulting which says you understand my problem and you can map it directly to your technology, and you can bring not only your product, but what we call the whole product, all the products and services necessary to take this problem and just 
crush it. If you can do that, and you can bring partners to the table to do it, and if you've ever done it before, God love you, I will pay a premium for that, and I will adopt now. Because frankly, I don't have a better choice. Okay? And so crossing the chasm was all about finding that use, we call it use case in the computer industry, that one application which says, wow, if you could just, like for example, way back in the day there was electronic pagers and who was gonna use them? Doctors decided we're gonna use them. Because doctors said, I can't have a, an answering service solve my problem, I need a pager. So that was an example of somebody who said, look, I will go, and doctors are not early adopters, right? But, but, they, were, but they were pagers, for that kind of idea. Okay, having said that, the bulk of the market is saying, no, we're, we're, we're a group. This is where most of the money is actually spent in the world. It's spent with people who say, we're gonna review the decisions, we're gonna put out requests for proposals, we're gonna study the facts, we're gonna have you do proof of concept, and we're gonna, we're gonna pick the best products and we wanna have good implementations, <coughs> and we need support and guaranteed availability. It's all the things that your father would say to you, right? Uh, when you were going out on a date as a teenager, right? And they will pay market rates, which is kind of what, what you need when you're, when you're building a company. They'll pay market rates. As you get later in the life cycle, you're getting, now everybody's kind of doing it, but some people are still not doing it. Well, who's not doing it? Well, the conservatives is not doing it. The conservatives saying, I hate this change. I hate it. Can I just stay with what I have a little bit longer? And so what they want you to do is say, if, you, if I have to change, and at some point they're gonna realize, you know, you do have to change. Okay, well, protect me. Think about my experience. Think about the fact that I hate you. You know, <laughs> I need a trusted advisor to guide me. I need standard configurations. I need a managed service. I need a mom, is what I really want, right? I want end-to-end -end support. And by the way, I don't want to pay very much, okay? Uh, but the truth is, these folks are important to any market when you start to scale it because they're, they're very loyal. By the way, once you win them as a customer, they never want to switch. So they're really important. But, but, they're, but, they're, but they're, not, they're not early adopters at all. And then the skeptics are the people that just go, you know, this is, this, I don't believe you're ever gonna be successful. But if you are, give me a guarantee, give me what they call strict service level ag uh, agreements, and I want rock bottom prices. So th this is when you're really at the very, very, very end of, of the folks. And if you never dealt with them, you'd be, you'd be fine. Okay, <laughs> so that's the five groups, okay? And the, the thing that's important about, I guess, about those five, those groups is, it's important to understand when you're having a conversation with a potential investor, a potential customer, a potential partner, who am I talking to? Because, because what they want to hear about, how they want to act with you, what, what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do is very different. And so it's important that you tune your ears to, to who am I talking to and, and is it time yet for me to be talking to that kind of person? And so what we've learned about this life cycle is, here's how it plays out over time. At the very beginning of the life cycle, the technology enthusiasts and the visionaries are both willing to get involved very, very early on, very early on. And the reason why is they tell you something that you just, it's music to your ears. What they say to you is, we believe what you believe. You kind of are all, in a sense, early adopters of sustainable aquaculture, right? That's kind of what's brought this group together. This is a community of belief. And you would be looking, if you're doing something novel, if you're taking one of the prize winning uh, offers from the F3 contest kind of thing, the, I would initially go to other people who believe what we believe. This is an important thing to do, sustainable. You know, we cannot uh, you know, continue to mine the forage, uh, the, the forage feed stock of the, of the ocean. We need to do something different. And I want to buy from you because I believe what you believe. It's important, it's a way all markets get started but it doesn't scale. And so, so the, the, because the rest of the curve does not believe what you believe. It's not that they disbelieve it, they just don't believe it, okay? In other words, they're not willing to act on belief. They're not, they're not, there's no act of faith. So that's what creates this thing that we ended up calling the chasm. And the chasm was just the pragmatist going, are you doing it yet? Are you doing it yet? Are you doing it yet? No, 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 okay, me neither. That's the chasm, okay? So you say, how do I start the dance on the other side of the chasm? We said the pragmatist in pain. We called it the bowling alley because the first pragmatist in pain is kind of like, like the first bowling pin. And it's a group of people that have this problem 
And they do not believe what you believe. That's not why they're willing to do business. What they say to you is, we need what you have. We, we cannot solve our problems with our conventional solutions. Either we're running out of food stock, or the prices are wrong, or, or, the, or there's regulatory uh, controls on this situation. We need a new solution, and, 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 it, and or we're going to be out of business. So it's not that we believe what you believe. We need what you have. Now, as you have more and more uh, customers, the bowling alley, the idea was the bowling pin was you get one group that needs what you have, you find a second group that needs what you have, they have, they have a slightly different problem, the third group has a third problem, but you're building a community of people that are all buying into the new innovation, and eventually you get to a point where people say, you know what, this is the new way to do things. This is, this is the new way to do things. And we call it the tornado because all of a sudden, instead of having to sell to you and to you and to you, it's like, no, 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 no. It's like the junior high dance. We're all going to jump out into the middle of the dance floor. Who wants to be sitting by the, by the wall, right? And so the tornado is not, we believe what you believe. The tornado is not, we need what you have. The tornado is, we want what they have. Okay? This is the time when the, when the herd stampedes, where we all say, look, this is, this is the new thing. We have to have Wi-Fi. Does, by the way, does anybody by any chance ha have a smartphone? <laughs> yeah, OK, OK. So you remember? Uh, because, because 15 years ago, the answer was no, right? So, uh, uh, but we went through a tornado. We want what they have. By the way, did, did anybody happen to have an Apple? I mean, it's like, did anybody happen to have you know, this haptic interface? Maybe just a few. OK, Black does anybody have a Blackberry? Oh, okay, but you, you, you see, well, but do you remember when I mean, there was a time when the BlackBerry was, was, was there? Okay, not anymore. Okay, so that's fine. So now everybody's bought their first one, and, and now the question is, you know, the life goes on, and we get to the conservatives, and the conservatives are saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I've actually, this is the Apple 3.0, I've had it for 17 years. <laughs> like, he, what, what, they, this person doesn't believe what you believe, they don't need what you have, they don't even want what they have, they like what they have. You just, just, just let me keep it, okay? Can, can you replace the battery? Oh my God, I have to get a new one? Okay, can you make it the same? Don't change it, okay? <laughs> so, so that's kind of what's going on there. So the point about this exercise is, each of these four stages, you, you have to sort of make a different promise to the world. And you have to fulfill a different promise to the world. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a startup, you want to start in the early market, but then you're going to want to cross the chasm, and then you're going to want to get to the tornado, and eventually you're going to get to, you're going to, get to Main Street. In that model, we're going to focus, you know, you write, this group here is saying, look, if I could just get to here, I, I might sell my company to a larger company, I can declare success. But getting to the early market success is not easy, and crossing the chasm is not easy. So I thought I'd close this first part by giving you, we have a playbook for each one. What's the playbook for winning in the early market? And what's the playbook for, for crossing the chasm? So the playbook for winning the early market, this, remember that this is the people who believe what you believe. The first thing is, you have to make what, the, what Intel, the Andy Grove at Intel called a 10x effect. You can't just make it a, a, a good improvement. You have to make a game-changing improvement, a completely different way of doing things. It just says, you know, we're going to play this game entirely differently. That's what this phone did, by the way. If you remember, prior to this phone, you had to get all your software from your, tele, your telco provider. Remember, it was on the deck, and you had these weird flip phones or whatever. Apple changed the game. And as a result, and by the way, Uber's changed the game. We, 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 we just don't play the game anymore with taxis the way we used to. Because there was an enormous amount of trap value, largely you waiting at a curb going like this, hoping a taxi would stop for you, which they wouldn't. If it was raining in Singapore, they certainly wouldn't. Uh, so, so, so if you could release the trap value and get the competitive advantage. So that's the first thought. Is my technology really, really disruptive? Then, can I find a customer who is willing to be the visionary, the engaged executive sponsor? They're going to create the budget. Nobody has a budget for what you're doing. So somebody's got to actually champion you enough to make the budget for it, and then enlist the team to support it. And then you have to bring a killer project team. You cannot bring, this cannot be the B team. This cannot be, your, this has got to be an all-star team because you're doing it 
in a very visible way for a very visible customer. If it's successful, it's going to put your innovation on the map. But if it fails, you don't get a second shot. So every talented person you can find, you want to put on that team. And what you're looking for is not, I mean, yes, there's a bunch of money, but the truth is the money will go away. It, it isn't necessarily even profitable because you're doing so many, so many new things. But what you want is a highly visible outcome. You want the world to say, wow, who was that? Who was that company? That was amazing. And I would suggest to you, that's what the F3 contest, and now the, I don't know if the current contest is still called F3, but that's this, you know, this thing in, 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 computer, uh, in the computer industry, we call it the X prize. But it's this idea of win this and put yourself on the map. Okay? That's the beginning, that you, you get noticed. But you don't have a company yet. What you have is an amazing accomplishment and the opportunity to create a company. To actually create that company, you have to find a cohort of customers who will be with you for the long haul. That's what crossing the chasm means. Okay? And so now what you have to do is you, you're looking for that pragmatist in pain. You're looking for a class of customer who says, we have a very painful uh, use case problem. And, and, and if you could help me solve that, if this is impacting my whole world, if you can help me solve that, you know, lock your dissertation about the, the shrimp bacteria that was blowing out the shrimp industry in Vietnam. You know, that was a painful unsolved problem, billions of dollars of problems. If you can help me solve that, you can take that, we definitely want to do work with you. And by the way, somebody in the customer's world is responsible for solving the problem and they're not doing it. It's not working. When Louis Pasteur went to the wine industry, you know, it wasn't working, right? And, and so his, his pasteurization became an amazing thing that he was able to do and took a bunch of wine managers off the hot seat. Killer solution team. So this isn't, tech, this isn't made of Sheldon geniuses. This is made of people that really understand the specific problem that you're trying to solve for that particular class of customer. They actually probably come from the customer's industry not from yours. So they really, really, really know what the customer is going through, and they can build that connection between your technology and the customer's problem and make sure it, 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 really, it really solidifies. And, and it create, it's got to create clear, immediate business value. When it does this, the world goes, well, look, I don't know if anybody else is going to use this, but I go back to my example with doctors and pagers. Once doctors had pagers, they were never giving them up. Because, because this was so much better than the world they had before. You probably don't even know that doctors didn't yeah, yeah, had problems. But anyway, there was a time when doctors didn't have any electronic devices, and this was a big deal. <laughs> then drug dealers were the second ones who needed electronic devices. <laughs> okay. But, this, but this, the point, from the point of view of the startup, because this is the last startup slide, what, this, is when you be, this, is what, this is the whole point of the contest. It's not just to get your, on the map is to get you across the chasm and a sustainable business that the world can then take. But for the world to take it to scale, we want to actually now involve the bigger companies in the room. But the bigger companies in the room can't get involved with you until you've done this. If you haven't crossed the chasm, you're, just, you're, too, you're too incomplete for the big company to help. But if you've crossed the chasm, now the big company says, ah, Maybe it's our turn, because what we want to do, we don't want to let be left behind. And this is really important in high tech. When high tech companies get left behind, as you're going to see on the next slide, it's not a pretty sight. But, 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 but and, they have, and if, you're in the, if, you're, if you're in the big companies, and now I'm talking to everybody in a big company in the room, you're going to have a problem with, with resource allocation I'm going to talk about in a minute that's really serious. And solving that is important if you're ever going to catch the next wave. And there are some frameworks that help there. So let me show you how this works. These are companies, I, I don't even know if you know who these companies are. In Silicon Valley, you, you, what I would say to an audience is start reading the companies at the bottom and sort of read upwards. Now, if you're in high tech, most of my, my clients in Silicon Valley, somewhere about here, they go, I don't know who these companies are. That's because they're like 35-year-old people, right? Yeah. If you're my age, you can go all the way to the top. Okay, but, but, these are, but here's the point. These are 56 companies. They don't exist anymore, not in the industries that they founded. But here's the weird thing. So you say, well, these are, these are the failures, right? No, these were the winners. These companies crushed it the first time. They crushed it, but they couldn't ever catch this next wave. Now, that's a very scary thought to a large company. 
which means I, uh, how do I, if I don't catch the next wave, if Amazon is, if I'm, in, if I'm Walmart and Amazon is doing e-commerce and I can't figure out a way to catch the next wave, I'm gonna write Walmart down here next, right? So how do, how do we keep that from going? And so what we learned about that was that when, the, when you're in a big company and you're sorting out your budgets during the budgeting crisis, you say, well, look, most of my money is going to go to what we call Horizon One. That means you're going to pay me back this year. And all the companies on that list did fine there. What we thought for a long time was, you know the problem with those companies that can't innovate? Turns out, not true. Brilliant innovation. The Macintosh was not invented by Apple. The Macintosh was invented by Xerox. It's just that Xerox could never, could never take it to scale. So the, the, the big, and IBM Labs, Nokia Labs, Bell Labs, I mean, really, really, really good, 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 uh, uh, far-reaching innovation. Now look, this is far-reaching. It doesn't pay back for three to six years. They can do that. They have good, they can afford it. The problem was when you went to say, okay, now it's time to take the new thing and make it really big, that's where it broke. This is what the companies couldn't do. They could invent it. Again, Xerox invented the Macintosh. They had it called it the Star Workstation. They could not take it to scale. Why not? Well, what happens is, and this is kind of the key learning from a big company is, if you're gonna catch the next wave, we call it the S-curve in technology, but it's the, it's the next wave. If you're gonna catch the next wave, you have to go through a J-curve. Well, what the hell's a J-curve? Well, the J-curve is a financial curve. I'm going to lose a pot full of money before I make money, okay? And every high-tech innovation as you're in the early market and crossing the chasm and trying to bring it to scale, you, this is what you've got to go through. And you say, well, okay, if that's what you have to go through to catch the next wave, who's up for this? Who is going to support this? And there's a lot, of, a lot of constituencies and they fall out differently. If you talk to venture capitalists, they go, you bet. This is, this is what venture capital is about. All of venture capital raises money and invests money in J-curves. And, and so the entire industry, the reason, people come to Silicon Valley to learn how to innovate because they think we're somehow smarter. Baloney, we're just founded on venture capital. And if you're founded on venture capital, this whole thing works perfectly. But when you become a publicly held company and you're now, you have public investors, public investors don't want to invest in this curve. So now you're, you're the CEO or the management team of a big company and you want to do this, but your board of directors is saying, We're gonna, we have to protect our stock price, you have to be careful here. So all of a sudden there's conflict. If you talk to your customers, the early adopter customers, the Steve Jobs and the Sheldons, they're saying, yeah, yeah, go, go, go. But the pragmatists are saying, slow down. You haven't even finished last year's stuff. I mean, come on, take some time, don't go so fast, don't take so much risk. If you are a little company and you're, you're like three or four, four or five or six in your category and you're thinking, I could use this to jump to number one, you might say, this is a good bet because maybe I can jump to the head of the pack. But if you're a successful big company and you're number one or number two or number three in your industry, no. Why would I, why would I risk my, my position doing this? And finally, if you're a sales team, if you're in a startup, it's really fun to sell the new stuff, by the way. It's very exciting. The demos are fabulous, by the way. But, but the, if, you're, if, you're, if you're an established company, you say, I just want to go to sales club. And, and nobody ever got to sales club selling in the J-curve. So the point is, the point about this whole exercise is, a lot of people say, how come startups can outperform the world's largest companies? This is why. The world's largest companies are conflicted. Startups are not conflicted, okay? They, they may not succeed, but if you give another dollar to a startup, it knows there's only one place to put it, and they know where they're gonna put it. And if you join a startup, and by the way, some of you are, you know your job is to get from here to here before you lose your company, right? So everybody's rowing in the same direction. But in a large company, a bunch of people are saying, no, we need to keep the existing businesses afloat, and other people are saying, no, we need to spend that dollar on the new businesses, and that's when we get the conflicts. And so what we learned about that is, in any large company that's dealing with disruption, there's actually four zones, and it'd be very valuable if you actually declared the zones as opposed to just discovered that you have them. 
But this is the zone, sustaining innovation, delivers material uh, revenue. This is the group that essentially pays for everything, okay? So, so, so th th this, th this is your existing business working with your existing customers. It's the heartbeat of your company. It's what everybody knows you for. It's really important. It pays all the bills. It's great, okay? So, so very, very important. But it's not the future. It, it's the present. It's the past, but it's not necessarily the future. Below it is a group of, a group of functions, finance, HR, IT, legal, marketing, customer support, supply chain, a bunch of people that don't actually make money. They actually, what they do is they run functions that support the main business. This is 90%, or you're gonna see, this is a big part of every, of every year's budget. And, and it, by the way, if there was no technology innovation, we're done. The, the, that, that's the whole company. But, but as, with all this new technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or wireless networking or, 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 or whatever it is, it, 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 or, or in your case, maybe the whole CRISPR gene and what, what can we do with CRISPR or what can we do with bioengineering, you need to have somebody in your company saying, what is that stuff? Because you, because you can't afford to get caught completely blindsided. You have to be able to say, I at least know what I'm dealing with here. I, I, I at least need to get my hands dirty with it. And those three zones are existing in large companies today, in, in industry after industry after industry. This is the zone that says we pay for everything. This is the zone that has Sheldon in it that says we're the smart people. These people are kind of the adults in the room. They're just trying to manage the stuff. And, and this, is, this is how we work together. And it's all fine. And it all works until we say, now we need to catch the next wave. <laughs> and now, all of a sudden, we have to go through that J curve. And here's what happens. You know, it, it has to do with resources. So there's something in the valley called Google's rule. So when you went to Google and they said, how should we put our money around this diagram? Google had a very clear answer. They said, put about 70% of your money in the existing business, okay? Put about 10% of your money in whatever, right? And put 20% of your money in the thing that you're gonna take to scale now. So you say, okay, seems like a good system. We'll try that. What actually happens? Well, what actually happens is you're in a large company. They say, but you know what? We're not doing, we're not catching the wave this year. What should we do with that 20, that 20%? Well, why don't we add it to our existing business? That feels pretty good. Now I've got 90% got of the money and, and I've got 10% going on here. Life, life's pretty good, right? This looks like year after year after year, and it's great until what happens is somebody says, okay, but now we need to go through a J-curve. Oh, I need 20% of the money. Well, well, wait a minute, I got 90% of the money. I don't know how good you are at math. <laughs> but I think you should notice that there's 100, there's, we're a little past 100% here. And so you think, well, now what do we do? And this is called a crisis of prioritization. This is what the 56 companies could not solve. At this moment, they, they, they got stuck. So there's not enough to go around. So the, the whole zone to win playbook says, okay, what would you do to catch the next wave? How would you actually play the game? Well, the first thing you say is, the single most important thing you wanna do is you want to catch the next wave. So that 20%, that comes first. Well, okay, so now I've got 10 and 90, and I only got 80 to play with, so what do I do? I have to take that 10 probably down to something less than five, I gotta take that 90 down to something less than 80, and the screams can be heard for miles, okay? Because these people are saying, look, I need that money, this is the money I've been counting on, I, I, I rely on this money, and the issue is, guys, if we're gonna make a transformation, we cannot fail. This, this is what those 56 companies did. They kept on starting a transformation and stopping. Starting and stopping. Because it just was too painful. And it just destroys a company. So if you're going to transform, you've got to, you have to do that. And this is, this is what you have to live with. So then that raises the question, well, Jeffrey, that's all very nice, but there's no chance we're gonna do that in my company. So now what? So here's what we've learned. We said, okay, if your company is not willing to go through the J-curve, and that is very frequently the case, here's what you can do. 
You could take the new technology, bring it into your existing systems, and just chip away at costs using the new technology. Not deploying it at scale, not revolutionizing your industry, but just finding ways to use the new technology. Like, for example, in computing, there's cloud computing. Well, cloud computing is actually cheaper than a data center. You can just put, you can just use a cloud instead of a data center and save money. You haven't changed anything. You're not Uber, you're not Airbnb, but you're spending less money and you're learning about the cloud. So that's like step one. The next step is, okay, wait a minute. We actually do want to adopt this and we want to start changing the way we run our business. So in the case of these aquacultural ideas, we're not going to go 100% whole hog into sustainable uh, uh, feed, but we're going, to, we're going to start introducing it at 5%. Or maybe we'll introduce it at 10%. Or maybe we'll say there's a sub-segment of our business that we're actually going to go all in on this, but other parts of our business we won't. We're changing our operating model, but we're still in the same business model. And then what happens in tech is you say, or maybe we should be in a whole other business. Maybe, maybe there's a different business for us to be in altogether. All, all so the idea behind this, and this is kind of the last slide, is when you're in a large company and you hear about the exciting things that are happening in this room, and you're thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, we're a big company. I'm not sure if this is ready to scale yet. What should we do? The first thing you should do is say, we need to find a way to participate in the innovation today. You can maybe have a small venture capital investment arm. You can bring technology inside. You might buy a small company. You might start a small group. But you need to learn about what is this and how does it impact our world. And then, depending on what you decide, you may say, look, our best bet in the short term is just to take some of this technology and use it in a very non-disruptive way in our company. Or then maybe the next thing is, I'm going to take this technology and I'm going to start to change the way we operate things. I'm not going to, tr I, I'm there's a lot of change management, but there's no J curves. So I don't have to have that, that and then the third thing is, no, you know what, I, I, we, we really are going to go all in. And now, and now we think we're ready to because we've had this experience and this experience to go forward. But I would just say that transformations for large companies are, are, are the exception, not the rule. So the last thought, so that, that, that's what I wanted to share with you. In Silicon Valley, the, the journey is the same. Both of these books are about essentially early market, crossing the chasm, getting to scale. This is the one, how do you do it as a startup? And the key thing is understanding that you have to change your strategy from, there's a time at the beginning of a startup that's so happy, it's weird, you have no money and you're thrilled and you're very happy. <laughs> it's true, because you're working with customers who believe what you believe. And it, you, you feel like you're like on a mission. I mean, f from God, probably, at least, OK? And then when you cross the chasm, you have to give that up. You don't give up your mission, but what you have to give up is that customer. And you have to work with a customer who really doesn't understand your mission, but who's in deep trouble. And you realize we can help that customer out. So it's a very, very different motion for your company. The leaders become different. So that's what crossing the chasm about. What this one's about is saying, OK, it's crossed the chasm. It's an interesting, viable thing. Are we going to make the sacrifice of taking money out of our existing businesses to put it into our, our, our new one? And that's the whole issue of, uh, of, of can, can we organize to handle that, that transformational demand. So those are some of the ideas I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. I think, I think you hit the bullseye. <laughs> so my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.